you're going to see it's a little it's written a little bit differently than the rest of Romans these eight verses but uh, let's read them here and then we'll we'll go through it uh, if you're able would you stand with me Romans chapter 3 verse 1 through 8 the Bible says here what advantage then have the Jew or what profit is there of circumcision much every way chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. But if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous? Who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. God forbid, for then how shall God judge the world? For if the truth of God had more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? And not rather, as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. Pray. Father, thank you for your word today. Lord, I pray that you'd give me clarity of mind and you'd help us as we go through this. Holy Spirit, speak to our hearts, minister to us, and we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Have you ever noticed that the majority of people are poor students of history? Um, I, I certainly was a poor student of history growing up. I didn't see the importance in it. And uh, as I get older, I meet some folks that really know their history well. There's a pastor over in England by the name of Dave Salt. And uh, whenever a group from America comes over to, to visit him, he takes them to different sites. And there's so much history in England, as you know. And boy, he can just rattle it off. And you really have an appreciation for his knowledge and his depth of, of understanding of history. And uh, we need to appreciate history, don't we? Amen. I've got some, uh, some answers here that some high school and college students, not little kids, but high school and college students wrote down his answers on tests, whether secular tests or Bible college tests. This is what they wrote down as answers. Moses led the slaves to the Red Sea where they made unleavened bread, which is bread without any ingredients. Wow. <laughs> How would you mark that as a teacher? Uh, Moses went up to the top of Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments. He died before he ever reached the land of Canada. <laughs> there's, there's truth in that. There's truth in that. <laughs> Solomon had 300 wives and 700 porcupines. Okay, these are high school and college students. The Greeks were a highly sculptured people. And without them, we would not have history. The Greeks also had many myths. A myth is a female moth. Is it E for effort? <laughs> I'm being serious. This is a real lip. Yes, I'm being serious. Ancient Egypt was inhabited by mummies. And they all wrote in hydraulics. They lived out in the Sarah Desert and traveled by Camelot. <laughs> in the Olympic Games, Greeks ran races, jumped and hurled the biscuits, and threw the java. <laughs> Eventually, the Romans conquered the Greeks. History calls the people Romans because they never stayed in one place very long. <laughs> hey, I guess too, but I'm not sure I guess this bad. Julius Caesar extinguished himself on the battlefields of Gaul 
But he was killed by his friends because they thought he was trying to be king. He was, as he was dying, he said these words, Tee he, Brutus. <laughs> it's sad, isn't it? It's not necessarily, I mean, it's funny, but it's kind of sad. Um, it was an age of great inventions and discoveries. Gutenberg invented the Bible. Another invention was the circulation of blood. Sir Walter Raleigh is a historical figure because he invented cigarettes and started smoking. The greatest writer of the Renaissance was William Shakespeare. He was born in the year 1654, supposedly on his birthday. <laughs> good chance. A good chance. He wrote tragedies, comedies, and hysterectomies. <laughs> Another great author was John Milton. Milton wrote Paradise Lost. Then his wife died and he wrote Paradise Regained. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln became America's greatest president. Lincoln's mother died in her infancy. Figure that one out. And Lincoln was born in a log cabin that he built with his own hands. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves by signing the emasculation proclamation. <laughs> On the night of April 14, 1865, Lincoln went to the theater and got shot in the seat by one of the actors in a moving picture show. The believed assassinator was John Wilkes Booth, an insane actor. This ruined Booth's career. <laughs> you think? <laughs> now the historical context of Romans chapter 3 is that Paul grew up in a Jewish religion. Yeah. He grew up as the greatest prosecutor and persecutor of Christianity. But then he got saved. Amen? Amen? And he became one of the greatest defenders of the faith. And in Romans chapter 1, we saw that he talks about how man is terribly sinful. And he gets on to the Gentiles and how they act and what they become when they live without God and they ignore the conscience and the creation that God has given every man that there is a true and living God. In Romans chapter 2, we see that Paul comes down hard on religious people. I mean, he nails the Jews. And along the way, he nails the Baptists, and he nails the Methodists, and he nails everybody else that is a religious person over having a relationship with Jesus Christ. We read the first eight verses of Romans chapter 3, and we'll get there in a minute. But in Romans chapter 3 and verse 9, he says, What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved, both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. And in the next few ver or in next few chapters, Paul's going to develop that fruit. But for today, he's going to defend Christianity. He's going to act as a prosecutor, and then he's going to stand up and give objections to uh, what people say against Christianity, and he's going to give the answers and defend the faith. And so, what a lame excuse. First lame excuse here, excuse number one. There is no value in being religious. And you could have gotten that from last week. Well, there is no value then in being religious. Romans chapter 3 and verse 1, the Bible says here, What advantage then have the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? And you and I could say today, well then, what's the purpose of going to church? What is the reason that we should read our Bible? What is the purpose of us 
going to Sunday school. That's how that correlates with us here today. In fact, last week, I should have convinced you, and Paul should have convinced you, that religion doesn't get you to heaven. Amen? Amen. It's just a load of stuff that you can do. You can get baptized, but it won't get you to heaven. You can come to church, but it won't get you to heaven. You can teach a Sunday school class, but it won't get you to heaven. These are religious things that people do. And be careful that you don't get so religious that you lose your relationship with Jesus Christ. And so people ask, and they're asking here, then why don't we just shut down all the churches? I mean, it's just all religion after all, isn't it? What value is there in being religious? Well, he answers that. You want to ask what value is there in being a Jew or what value is there in being a Baptist or what value is there in, in coming to church? Well, verse uh, 2 of chapter 3, he says, much in every way. There's great value in being religious. Don't just throw it all out. He says, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. Amen? Amen. You got the finished, written down revelation of God. The truth here for this is God has given you and He's given me His written word. Amen. So there's great value in coming to church. Why? Because you're exposed to the written word of God. There's great value in coming to Sunday school. Why? Because you're exposed to the teaching of the Word of God. Isn't that wonderful? Praise the Lord. Inside this Bible right here, you, you never need to, to worry or, or wonder what God is saying. You just have to study it a little bit longer. The Bible says in Romans chapter 15 and verse 4, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. You see that? Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. The Bible teaches us how we ought to live. The Bible teaches us how we ought to behave. We couldn't have church without a Bible. In fact, when you go to church... The preacher ought to open up the Word of God, and he ought to say, Thus saith the Lord. Amen? Amen. And, and enough of the opinions already, enough of the philosophy already, and give us the Word of God, because that's what we hunger for, that's what we need. Amen? Amen. 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 I heard of a man in Kansas City years ago, and he got injured in an explosion where he was blinded and badly disfigured up his arms, on his hands, on his face. You can imagine his horror when he realized after the explosion that he could no longer see. He couldn't read the Bible anymore. And so he thought, I've got to learn Braille. And so he ordered the Bible in Braille. And he began to try with his fingers to read the Bible in Braille. But he found that they were so desensitized, he'd lost all the nerve endings because of the explosion, that he couldn't do Braille with his fingers. Somebody told him about a girl in England that had learned to do Braille with his lips, with her lips. And so there he pressed his face against the Braille Word of God, and he tried, she tr uh, tried to read the Word of God with his lips. But couldn't. It was so desensitized on his lips, he couldn't feel the word of God across his lips. And off chance, he, his, his tongue touched across the braille. And he realized he had feeling on his tongue. And so he began to learn braille with his tongue. And before he died, he'd read the Bible four times entirely through with his tongue. Folks, that convicts me. I mean, I have two good eyes. And I have two good hands. And I have plenty of Bibles at home. Do I hunger for the Word of God like that? Say, what value is there in being religious? What value is there in coming to church? 
What value is there in showing up at 10 o'clock for Sunday school? The eternal word of God is being preached. Amen. That's what value. And we live in a day and age when we can get the word of God. We can get it freely. Be careful you don't take it for granted. Amen. Hunger for the word of God. Crave the word of God. Put down your phone and check your computer sometime. And open up the old rugged pages of your Bible that should be tear stained. And read and enjoy and let the word of God warm your heart. Amen. It's a lame excuse. I don't have to go to church. I can study the Bible at home. Do you? Excuse number two. God hasn't been faithful to me, so I sin. God hasn't been faithful to me, so I sin. Look at Romans chapter 3 and verse 3. That's essentially what he's saying here. He says, For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? No, God is still faithful. Amen? Amen. God forbid, he said, yea, let God be true. Why? Because God is true. But every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. Some people say, I don't go to church. I don't have time for God because God has let me down. God has failed me sometime in my past. You see, God has been unfaithful to me. And so I'm going to live the way I want to live. And I'm going to justify my sin now. Because I could never worship a God like that. Whatever it was. I, I know my mom. I witnessed to her after, she, after I got saved. Try to get her to get saved, and she told me all kinds of things. And one of the things she said was, When your grandma and granddad were over from England and they were visiting us in Canada and they were staying down in the basement in our house, and your granddad had that heart attack, she said, I prayed to God for him to heal granddad. Granddad died. Folks, we all know somebody like that. And how could I worship a God that could let my granddad die or my son die? How could I worship a God that let my son die? Where was God when my son died? Could I suggest that God was at the same place when his son died? Amen. Folks, we live in a sin-cursed world. We're surrounded by sin-cursed people. And we don't understand it all. In fact, I, 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 I guess to say that maybe we understand 2% of eternal reality. And someday we'll understand the other 98%. But for now... Don't question God's faithfulness to justify your sin and live in the filth of the, of the sewer. Uh, let's, let's talk about faithfulness for a second, shall we? I mean, you want to hold God at that standard. How faithful are we? Amen. Now, perhaps my wife looks at me one day and she says, Honey, have you been faithful to me throughout my marriage? And I say, honey, I've been 80% faithful. That's not faithfulness. No. Or what if I say, honey, I've been faithful 95% of the time to you. Isn't faithfulness like an all or nothing proposition? Yeah. How faithful have we really been? And we want to question God when we don't understand just to justify our sin, that's a lame excuse. God is faithful. God is true. That's his very character. That's his very nature to be faithful. Has God ever let you down? Has God ever let you down? Some people honestly say yes. And again, it's just because they don't understand it all. Look in James chapter 1, if you would, with it. Here's the issue. 
James chapter 1 and verse 13. The Bible says here, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. You know, it's human nature to justify our behavior and to just to excuse our sinfulness. That's human nature. That's why the, uh, the, this is in the book of James. Because they had people back then, just like they have people today, that are looking to excuse their behavior and blame their sin on so-and-so did this to me or this happened in my life or God didn't come through the way I thought he should. My friends, that's a lame excuse. It doesn't change the faithfulness of God. He's still faithful. He's still true. And by the way, you're still going to have to stand before God for the way you're living your life. It doesn't change any of it. I've heard a state trooper telling stories of some of the excuses he's heard. You can imagine. Pull over people for speeding. Oh, I have my cruise control set. I don't understand. My speedometer's broken, I guess. Oh, come on. I was just going to flow of traffic. Why are you picking on me? You ever use those? He said there's one excuse that he heard that he's never heard since, but boy, it was a good one. He pulled over this little old lady, and he said, Man, you, you were doing 60 miles an hour in a 45. You want to tell me why you're doing 60 miles an hour? And she just looked at him and said, Sonny, you're wrong. I haven't even been driving for an hour. <laughs> and he thought of that, and he thought, Well, she's got a point in it. <laughs> Slow down, and, and he let her go. But excuses, they go right back to the Garden of Eden, don't they? They go right back to the Garden of Eden where God said, I've got this little, this little tree sitting here. I've got something that's set apart for me. I don't want you to justify taking it by any means. And Adam and Eve, they come along, they partake of that fruit. And when God corners Adam, Adam says, it's the woman you've given me. Now, ladies, you know why we blame you so much. Right? <laughs> but come right on us. We want to blame our wives. We want to blame God. We want to blame everybody else except for ourselves. It's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Amen. Well, what about you, Eve? God said, well, it was that snake. And of course, he didn't have a leg to stand on, did he? <laughs> Let's just keep passing the buck. Blame somebody else for our sin. It's a lame excuse. Excuse number three. The more evil I do, the better God looks. Have you ever heard somebody say that? No? I have. And, and that's what Paul's saying here. He's saying in verse five, but if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? I mean, that's good, right? I mean, we're talking about our sinfulness commending or <laughs> separating out the righteousness of God. Hey, by, by me doing evil, I'm actually making God look good. And he says in verse 5, Is God righteous who taketh vengeance? I mean, he really shouldn't be punishing me because the more wicked I do, the better I just make him look. And then Paul says, I speak as a man. In other words... I'm saying this. This isn't what God's saying. This is what I'm saying. And, and that's pretty foolish, isn't it? Yeah. Verse 6, God forbid, he says. For then how shall God judge the world? <laughs> For if the truth of God had more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? It just doesn't fit, y'all. People say every time I lie, it just makes God that much better, right? It just makes him look that much truer, right? Paul says 
that's ridiculous. That's crazy thinking. Well, you're just going to the ends of the earth to come up with some way of justifying the way you live. Verse 8, he says, And not rather, as we slanderously, uh, as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, we've got people going around saying this, let us do evil that good may come. Hey, we'll hasten the day of the Lord. Let's just be a bunch of dirty, rotten, filthy, stinking sinners so that God will come back sooner. Judge us all and then we'll all go to heaven. That's what Paul says about that. He says, your damnation is just. Your damnation is... What a silly excuse. What a lame excuse. What kind of wicked sinner are you to think that you even have a right to compare yourself to the righteousness of God and hasten Him and control Him? What kind of wicked, perverted sinner are you? Isn't that what he's saying? Some people think they don't have to live by any rules. A lot of people think they don't have the law apply to them. Now there's a word for that. It's called antinomianism. Antinomianism. The, no, the word nomos means laws, and the word anti means against. So there's a bunch of people that are antinomious, and they're going around figuring we don't have to live by those laws. We don't have to live by God's standard. We don't have to live by a biblical standard. We can live the way we want to. Now, they don't go around wearing a t-shirt, I don't think, that says, I'm an antinomian. And I don't think they go to Antinomianist Anonymous. But I see them wearing no fear shirts. I see them wearing uh, no rules shirts. I see them talking about there being no limits. And what they're doing is they're comparing themselves to God. We make a big mistake when we try to compare ourselves to God. Amen? Uh, who are, how are we ever justified thinking, well, we can just control the day of the Lord? Boy, I just made God look real good being a filthy sinner. He should be proud of me. Because he looks just so righteous. The problem with that is God has got a totally set of values, obviously, than you do. Amen? It's like the little boy that had a puppy. And he went up to his mom and said, Mom, I'm going to sell my puppy. And she said, Okay, what are you going to sell him for? Well, he's a pretty nice puppy, so I'm going to sell him for $10,000. And Mom just smiled and said, Good luck. And he left the house that morning. He came back before lunchtime. She said, How'd it go? He said, I sold the puppy. She said, Did you have to come down on your price? He said, Not at all. She said, you mean to tell me you got $10,000 for your puppy? Well, sort of. I traded him for two $5,000 cats. <laughs> it's the same idea when we think we can compare ourselves to God. We've got a totally different set of values than God has. God has a totally different way of operating. He says, you can try to justify it all you want to, but the truth of the matter is, God is still righteous, and He can't become more righteous just because you're living in your sin. But the truth of the matter is, unless you repent, you're not going to escape condemnation. Amen? Stop coming up with lame excuses why you don't have to go to church, why you don't have to read your Bible, why, don't you, why you don't have to be praying for your family, and why don't you just conform to the book that God gave us. Amen? Because yeah. we're still going to be judged by it no matter what you and I come up with. And so Paul, with an expert legal mind, is just knocking them up, or setting them up and knocking them down. Setting them up, and knocking them down. And the truth of the matter is, Hebrews 2 3 says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. God must punish sin because God is holy. Amen? Amen. 
And God's not going to take it easy on you because you feel like you have a rational approach to this whole subject called Christianity and you can justify your sin because so and so you prayed a prayer someday. God's not going to take it easy on you just because you think, you think he's going to. Amen? That's the truth of the matter. Uh, the truth of the matter is if God was ever going to take it easy on sin at any point, it wouldn't be when his son hung on the cross. It wouldn't be for you or for me. It wouldn't be when he was up there, when he was bruised for our iniquities, when he was whipped for things that we did, that he never did. It would have been when all of mankind's sin was poured upon him on the cross and, and it was so wicked and was so vile that God the Father had to turn his back on the Son. And Jesus said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He didn't take it easy on him. He's not going to take it easy on you and me. Our only choice is to repent and get saved. Amen. And then as we sin as a Christian, repent and get right and restore that fellowship and continue on with a relationship that was first born once we trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior. We can either face judgment on our own or we can stand at the foot of the cross with Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And he's already paid it. That's, that's the choice we have. How can we escape if, if uh, we reject God's judgment against sin? How can we? We can. The only way is by standing at the foot of the cross. When the settlers were settling America and they drove out west, they had quite a time when the, uh, the planes would catch on fire. And everything back then was made of wood and uh, they didn't quite know how to control the fires that whipped across the planes. And so often the only thing they could do when they saw a fire ravaging over the horizon is quickly grab their stuff and run out before it. And everything that they'd built and owned would all be devastated by the fire and they'd come back and try to rebuild. Well, they learned after a while there was another way. They learned that if they could see that fire off on the distance soon enough, that they could have a controlled burn around their house and around their barn and around their corral. They could go out and they could light that dry grass on fire all around their property and then quickly extinguish it. And then the safest place for them to be would be in the midst of that burned out ground. That fire would come up, it had nothing to grab hold on to. And that, that fire would just consume everything around you. And that's the same thing for you and me, friend. Once you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, you recognize that God's judgment for sin was exacted on that cross 2,000 years ago. And you cling to that old rugged cross. And you ask Jesus Christ to save you. He will be your Savior. You'll be forgiven. You'll be standing at the foot of the cross where God's judgment has, uh, uh, was exacted in history. The only time it's ever been exacted. So it's your choice. It's my choice. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Why don't we stand our feet, bow our heads, close our eyes. I don't know what kind of excuses that you have in your mind today for why you don't obey the Word of God. But I'd like to encourage you to put them aside. Look at them as just a lame excuse. Ask the Lord to forgive you. Give it over to Him. Ask the Lord for strength to obey His written Word. And live the life that he has for you. There's no joy of being right with God. There's no invincibility outside of the will of God. You're, the safest place for you and for me is to be a saved and sold out Christian. On fire for God. Hungering for his word. Desiring to do his will. Desiring to stay right with him. And then when we're wrong, we automatically confess and forsake it. And continue to live for him. As the pianist plays this morning, if you've got a decision to make, why don't you come?
seeing you there and Sunday for old fashioned day. God bless you. Have a great afternoon.